Okay, everyone, here we are for part three of the uh, Tamerlane Chess uh, instructional series. Um, I told you last time that after do working on pawn promotion that we'd jump right into what the citadels um, mean, and that's what we'll jump right into. So the citadels, again, are the two squares um, that are extraneous to a regular chessboard. One protrudes off the left side of rank nine over here, and the other citadel protrudes off the right side of rank two. Now the citadels have a special purpose on the board in that if your shah, your main king, at any time during the game manages to work his way into his opponent's citadel, not his own citadel, but his opponent's citadel, he can declare the game a draw. Now remember, in Tamerlane chess, I'm not sure if I mentioned this yet or not, we'll talk a little bit about the end game here. In Tamerlane chess, getting your opponent in a stalemate is a win for the aggressor. Getting your opponent in stalemate is actually a win. It is not a draw like in modern chess like we're used to. So for that reason, it's advantageous for a losing uh, shah, a losing player, to get his shah into the opponent's citadel because then he can declare a draw because he cannot hope for a draw during stalemate. Um, stalemate, it would be a loss for him. Now, the ranking, uh, we talked last time about multiple kings being on the board. Uh, the king, the pawn of pawns promotes to a piece, which I didn't show you before, known as the adventitious king, which I made here as just a smaller version of the king. And the pawn of shahs, or kings, promotes to a prince, which I've depicted like this. They kind of all look similar, the kings, um, in reducing size. So when, when all three of these, or multiple of these, are occupied on the board, <clears throat> the general rule, or the, the actual rule, is that the shah, the main shah, outranks the prince, which in turn outranks the adventitious king. So the ranking goes like this, shah, then prince, then adventitious king. Only the highest ranking of these three pieces on the board can enter the opponent's citadel to declare a draw. So in the event that the, all three or two out of these three occupy the board, if the main shah is captured then, because remember if multiple kings are on the board, they must be captured until only one remains who can then be stalemated or checkmated. So the, the main shah must then, is, if that piece is captured, then only the highest ranking on the board can then enter the opponent's citadel. So in that case, only the prince would be able to enter the opponent's citadel to declare a draw. If the prince was captured and the shah are captured and the only king on the board is the adventitious king, then he has the ability to enter the opponent's citadel to declare a draw. So only the highest ranking uh, piece, the king on the board, can enter that citadel. Now I told you that the adventitious king um, which comes from the pawn of pawns through that convoluted complex route we talked about on the last video. I told you he has a special privilege when it comes to the citadels, and that special privilege is the following. He is the only piece in the game of Tamerlane chess who can enter his own citadel. Instead of his opponent's citadel, he can enter his own citadel. And the purpose of this would be to block his opponent from entering the citadel to declare a draw. So if he doesn't want his opponent getting in his citadel, his opponent's shah, or his opponent's highest ranking king, to come in and declare a draw, he can put his adventitious king in there, thus blocking that from happening. Now, a couple other things about the citadels. <clears throat> when the king gets into his opponent's citadel, as I said, he can declare a draw. There's another option he can also do instead of declaring a draw when he enters the opponent's citadel. If he has either an adventitious king or a prince on the board at the time, either of those or both, then when he enters his opponent's citadel, instead of declaring a draw, he also has the option of switching places with one of these two pieces wherever they are on the board. So if he's escaping some uh, problematic situations, running away from some pieces, he can get into the opponent's citadel and then switch places with, say, his prince here, and his prince then goes in the citadel and they switch places. He has the option of doing that instead of declaring a draw but only one time. This exchange can only happen one time during the game. So if he has switched places and now his prince or adventitious king occupies the opponent's citadel, that piece can later move out of the way to make room for the shah to enter a second time. He's allowed to enter the citadel a second time, but on the second entering he can only declare a draw because the exchanging with another king can only happen one time during the, the game. So on the second entering of the opponent's citadel, the game would be declared a draw. 
Okay, that pretty much sums up um, the rules regarding the citadels and what their purpose is. Um, there's a couple other miscellaneous rules um, to the game of Tamerlane Chess, which I can get into now. Um, one of them I already mentioned, a stalemate is considered a win for the aggressor. Also, bearing your opponent's king is not considered a win in this game. Sometimes in the game of, of modern chess, if you bear your opponent's king, which means you take get rid of all his other pieces, you capture all his other pieces, so he is the only piece of his kind left on the board, he, he's your opponent's only piece, that is not necessarily a, 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 uh, a win for the aggressor because he still has the option of possibly making it into his opponent's citadel to declare a draw. So bearing your opponent's king is not necessarily a win in the game of Tamerlane chess. Um, another um, thing to talk about regarding the citadels is that, as I said, when your adventitious king is the only piece that can enter your own citadel, the adventitious king, if your adventitious king enters your citadel and he's waiting there blocking anyone else from entering it, if during that time all the other kings on the board are captured and taken away so that your adventitious king is now your last piece remaining on the board, well then he can no longer stay in the citadel because he's now the last king on the board. So what you do is, in that situation, when he becomes the last king on the board, you immediately move him to the original square of the pawn of pawns which is over here. He immediately gets moved to that square. If that square is occupied, he gets moved to the next closest starting pawn square. So you keep going until there's a starting pawn square which is unoccupied, and your adventitious king gets placed in the first unoccupied pawn square. He also cannot get placed in that square if, if doing so would put him in check, because a king obviously cannot move into check. So if by putting himself in the square puts him in check, again he moves to the first square that is unoccupied and which does not put him in check. That's what happens if your adventitious king is sitting in the citadel and suddenly becomes the only king left on the board. Another rule in Tamerlane Chess that I didn't mention before is that there is no castling. Uh, the exchange of the <coughs> king with the rook castling that we know happens in the modern chess. There is no castling in Tamerlane Chess because castling was an invention that happened about a hundred years later in Europe. So there was no castling at that time, and there was also no double first pawn moves. We know in the game of modern chess, on the very first move that your pawn makes, he's allowed to move either one or two squares. That's called a double first move. There is no double first move in Tamerlane chess. That was also not invented until later, I believe, in Europe. So because there's no double first move, um, by default that means there's no en passant capture, where an enemy pawn... If you move two squares, he can act as if you had only moved one square and capture you this way. That's called an en passant capture in modern chess. There is no castling, no double first move, and no en passant capture in the game of Tamerlane chess. And I think that pretty much covers everything. Um, just last to say, kind of common sense, but there's no other fide uh, international reasons for a draw, such as the 50 move draw, um, the threefold repetition draw. Um, none of those types of draws exist in Tamerlane Chess, as obviously they were not invented until much later, um, mostly associated with the Fide Association. So no 50 move draw, no threefold repetition draw, bearing your king is not a win, there's no castling, no first double move, and no en passant uh, in Tamerlane Chess. Um, one last thing I'll leave you with is a quote from Tamerlane's biographer, who was a man by the name of Ahmed ibn Arab Shah. He wrote a manuscript in the early 15th century, shortly after Tamerlane's death, um, entitled Tamer the Great Amur. It was, a, it was a manuscript that was devoted to Tamerlane's life. And just to show you some of his obsession with chess, or some of at least Tamerlane's perceived obsession with chess, I want to read you a passage from that quote, and take this with a grain of salt, um, <clears throat> because sometimes biographers tended to build up their subjects and embellish. But here is a passage from Ahmed ibn Arab Shah and Tamer the Great Amur. Tamer also ordered a city to be built on the near bank of the Jaxardes and joined it to a bridge over the river with anchors and skiffs, which city he called Sharukia. 
and it was placed in open country. The reason why he had distinguished his son by this name, Shahrukh, and also this city, Shahrukhia, was that when he was engaged according to his habit of playing chess with one of his attendants, and had already ordered that this city should be built on the bank of this river, and one of his concubines was present with him in a state of pregnancy, he attacked his opponent with the Shah's Rook. So the rook on the Shah's side of the board. And by this move, his opponent was weakened and unnerved. And while he was defeated, two messengers appeared at that exact time. One of whom announced that a son had been born to him, and the other that the building of the city was finished. And therefore, he called both by this name and distinguished him by this mark. So he named, according to uh, Ibn Arab Shah, his biographer, he named both his son and a city he had built after the Shah and the Rook, the Shah's Rook. And it is documented that Tamer did have a son by the name of Shah Rook, and there was a city built uh, by the name of Shah Rukia. So whether these stories are true seems to be a, a possibility. And I've really enjoyed making these videos. Um, I'm gonna look for any rules or details I may have missed, and I will probably make a fourth video, which is just a summary of the first three because these first three videos are going to be adding up to close to 35 or more minutes um, so I'm going to try to do a instead of having to listen to all that twice um, I'm sure I bored you enough the first time I'm going to make a summary of the entire rules of Tamerlane chess so you can listen to that and refresh your memory I'm going to try to keep it under seven or eight minutes long and we'll see how that turns out thanks a lot